Hello and welcome everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, welcome to this GMDSI webinar on uncertainty in groundwater modeling 101. My name is Ree Hugman. I'm a researcher at Flinders University in Australia, part of the NCGRT here, and I'm part of the GMDSI team. It's my pleasure today to, to chair and facilitate the webinar. Uh, speaking, we have uh, John Doherty and Catherine Moore. Catherine, amongst other things, is a senior groundwater modeler at GNS in New Zealand, and John is probably most known as the developer of PEST. Both are key members of the GMDSI team. Today, they will be addressing the underlying concepts rather than technicalities of predictive uncertainty in groundwater modeling. So a bit more of an, a conceptual overview and not a hands-on how-to type of webinar. Um, before we get started, I just need to do a bit of housekeeping. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. As you can see, some people have already put some stuff in there. Uh, we'll try and address these questions at the end of the talk, but feel free to put them in throughout the, the presentations. Uh, please keep any general uh, conversation to the, the chat window so that these things are kept separate. Before we get started, I'm going to run a, a quick poll. It should take, I'll give you a short two minutes to answer the questions. There's only two or three, and then I'll quickly share, share the results of that poll. Let me just remember how to do it. Open the poll. Okay. And that should be popping up so that you'll give you three minutes to, to answer that if you like. Um, these things, these questions are, are useful to help us get a feeling for who it is that we're speaking to. And I guess it's also nice for yourselves to, to get a feel for who else is in the room. Okay, we've got quite a few people progressing through it. Do you want to say good morning, Kath and, and John? Good morning, everyone. I'm just looking at the attendee list here. I think there's some people listening who could give this talk just as well as we could. So, <laughs> I hope we don't mess it up, Kath. If we do, there's people there who'll know we've messed it up. So, just another minute and a half. How does one actually share this? I can't remember. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, close. <laughs> that's not a good start. You need to go to a training webinar, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like almost everyone is finished. We've got a nice list of people here, a couple hundred or a couple hundred odd already. And almost finished with the poll. Seems like we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of people from research in the in the audience. A couple of superheroes, which is always fun. Uh, a lot of modelers listening in, and then followed by uh, a few people who review or work with modelers seem to be the next highest group members. Yeah, they ought to choose their company better, I think. <laughs> okay, I see a lot of you received information about this through the newsletter. Everyone seems to think that uncertainty is too often ignored. And a few people who have a different opinion. I'll just 10 seconds to close the poll and share these. Okay, there you can see the results if you're interested. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of people in the uh, in industry and um, research, a few regulators, which is interesting, and the odd superhero, a lot of modelers, and most people heard, heard about this from the newsletter and think that uncertainty is too often ignored. So, interesting results or outcomes. Um, perhaps now we can hand things over to Kath and get this going. Uh, so, welcome everyone to today's webinar on model predictive uncertainty. This webinar was prepared in response to a number of requests to discuss why there's so much uncertainty and groundwater models and how it can be quantified. As advertised and just mentioned by Rue, we're not going into details, so there's no maths, but we do try and address the concepts on which the details rest. And today is also laying the groundwork for the next webinar on model complexity, which is inextricably linked to uncertainty quantification, as we'll discuss next time. We think both of these are really important for modeling topics given that our role as modelers is often to quantify the uncertainty of decision support model predictions and to reduce them as much as we can given the information we have. I'll start by showing a numerical modeling case study which demonstrates how even with a perfectly calibrated model, predictions can be very wrong. You may have seen this case study before as it was the outcome of my early PhD work which John supervised. 
These slides made a profound impact on both of us at the time, and we've both used these slides liberally since then, and others have also, for their shock and awe value. The model is synthetic with a rectangular model domain, and water flows into the model at the top of the model domain and leaves through a fixed head boundary at the bottom. A particle is released near the top and then moves through the model domain, and the time it takes for this particle to reach the bottom boundary is our model prediction. The flow field is steady state, and groundwater flows through a heterogeneous medium as shown here, with blue being more conductive and green less conductive, and that conductivity is varying over about an order of magnitude. And our particle exit time prediction is around 3,256 days. The flow field is sampled at these 12 locations, and these 12 head measurements form our calibration data set. And now we'll make a prediction with our calibrated model. We can see that our calibrated hydraulic conductivity field here on the right is a much smoother version of the true conductivity field here on the left. Our calibrated model is, has given us the simplest way to fit the data, which is also our minimum error variance solution. That is, our potential for wrong is minimized. That is what calibration is giving us. We can also compare the predictions made with both parameter fields. Our calibrated model is giving us a prediction of 7,122 days, so it's wrong by about 100%, even after fitting those 12 heads perfectly. Yet this is a good model according to the metrics that we should be applying. It doesn't give us the right answer, but the prediction that we make with our calibrated model lies within the uncertainty limits that we can calculate with that model. So we haven't underestimated uncertainty. We can see here another five very different hydraulic conductivity fields that all also fit those 12 head observations perfectly. And there are zillion others, and we show how to calculate these later in the webinar. So non-uniqueness is clearly an issue. There are many, many ways to fit the data during history matching. If we make the prediction with many fields that are consistent with the data, those 12 head observations, this prediction will range from roughly 3,200 to 12,500 days. And the prediction that we're making with our calibrator model is roughly in the center of that range of predictions that we get through history matching. So our calibrated model is giving us the prediction that's consistent with the theory. That is, it's giving us the minimum error variance solution and the potential for wrongness is roughly symmetrical around the solution. So this example clearly depicts the impact that model scarcity has on a prediction. It also demonstrates the pivotal role that uncertainty needs to have in decision support modeling. The model is a good model. It's not giving us the right answer, but the right answer is within the uncertainty limits that we can calculate if we choose to do so, while still respecting the need to match those 12 heads. There'll always be uncertainty, and our job is to quantify this and process data in a way that reduces it as much as that data will allow. It's all about uncertainty, it's quantification, and processing data using the model to reduce this uncertainty. So the model is a data processing tool rather than a simulator. We've just seen that our simulation ability is quite poor, but our data processing ability is actually quite good. And at this point, I hand over to John. As Kath said, um, if we're going to be doing this decision support modeling thing, then it's incumbent on us to quantify uncertainty. And as Kath also said, what we're doing here is we're just talking about the principles rather than the details. So when we, and, and to give voice to those principles, I'll start off with a um, with a can with a, an example I'll just show an example here and that'll be illustrative of the, the concepts that I'm talking about so let's pretend that uh, we're extracting water from a deep layer here and that we're interested in whether that extraction is going to affect the flow in that river so normally before we do any modeling we've got a geological co uh, conceptual model so this is the outcome of site characterization and, and a whole lot of geological insights. Now, those geological insights will normally have a fair bit of detail. So in this case, <clears throat> we can say, well, okay, there's a lot of things can happen between where we pump here and whether there's going to be an effect here. The, the properties of the weathering layer. How thick is the weathering layer? How does it vary from place to place? Uh, how well is the river connected to the ground here, one kilometre down its reach? The alluvial system here, that's uh, the deposits of the river over a millennia. There's going to be channel deposits and there's going to be overbank deposits. Channel deposits will probably be pretty permeable. 
over bank deposits, much less so. Are these channel deposits, how long are they? And very importantly, are they connected? Because if you've got two permeable media that are connected, well, that enhances the ability of drawdown to propagate to the target. And the opposite for impermeable media, these overbank deposits. If the impermeability is connected, well, that can block the passage of the drawdown transmission from the source to the target. So the properties of the media and the connectedness are a big deal. And the devil here is in the detail. And part of the geological model, the conceptual model on which we're basing this, is going to be that detail. To continue, there's uh, a, a, an unconformity here. What are the properties of that and how does that vary from place to place? Oh, there's a fault here. Now, this, this throws in a whole lot of details, all of which are uncertain. And that's the thing about geological detail. That detail is important but the details of the detail are unknown. And that's just an important property of, the, of almost the quicksand on which we build our numerical model. There's a whole lot of detail, but every one of those details, there's actual specifications of those details within the earth are not known. So returning to our concepts here, the fault. Does that offset or does that, does that join permeable media? If it does so here, what about at one kilometre down the strike? Can water flow up the fault? Can it flow up the damage zone? Or does the fault present an obstacle to lateral movement of drawdown? What about the layer at which we're pumping from? There'll be permeable and impermeable lithologies. Are those permeable lithologies connected to each other or not? Once again, the devil's in the detail the ge geological conceptual model tells us the details important, but the geologist cannot tell us the exact nature of that detail as it pertains to the area which is the subject of our investigation. So this is the terrain in which we're working. The fact that detail is important, but the fact that the details of the detail are unknown is why there is so much uncertainty, one of the reasons why there is so much uncertainty in groundwater modelling. There's the hydraulic properties at every place that can vary wildly and there's the connectedness of hydraulic properties that can vary wildly. So how do I accommodate this situation? Well, in principle, it's not too hard. In principle, I just, we just recognise what I said. We've got a geological conceptual model here. It includes a lot of detail, but the details of the detail are unknown. So our job as modelers is to come up with different possibilities for that detail, build a model, run the model, make predictions, and build up the uncertainty distribution of a prediction. So for each one of the possibilities that may exist under the ground here, the connectedness or not, of different lithologies, of cross-fault connectedness or not, the properties of the fault, I say, okay, this is a possibility for how that detail may actually exist under the ground. Let me build a model incorporating that particular possibility of all these details. Let me run the model. Let me make a prediction. Then I do it again for another set of possibilities that are that are concordant with the geological conceptual model, but which are different manifestations that are concordant with that model. Different connections, different hydraulic properties here or there, different details about the detail that is so important to answering this management question. So in conceptually, that's how we could explore the uncertainty of whether pumping here affects drawdown affects the, the water in the river. In practice though, and well, before we get onto the practicalities, we'll introduce some terminology here, terminology which we're going to use for the remainder of this talk, terminology which you'll come across any time you read about uncertainty analysis and groundwater modelling. Every time we come up with a different possibility of what that detail may actually be, that's called a realisation. 
This methodology of coming up with different possibilities is called Monte Carlo analysis. When we run the model and make this collection of predictions to build up our predictive histogram, that's we are analyzing the prior uncertainty of the prediction. Prior to what? Prior to history matching. We'll get onto that in a minute. But what's really important here is the notion that the geological conceptual model really isn't complete until it comes up with a way of giving voice to the possibilities which may exist. So it's all very well saying, oh, there's a whole lot of details which may affect the prediction. We all know that. How do we come up? What is the methodology by which we can, in a computer, generate different realizations of that detail? Now, there's a whole field of study which actually looks at this and it's called geostatistics. However, the, while it provides a lot of insights, I think we'd all agree that of all the different possibilities that may exist here in two and three dimensions, coming up with a computer-based method that will give rise to all different possibilities is going to be a tall order. And what if it's still not complete? What if it denies some possibilities which still may exist down there? Possibilities of connectedness or not? And don't forget, this is three-dimensional, so that's a difficult problem. So added to the problem of giving numerical voice to the myriad of possibilities of connectedness and hydraulic properties that may exist under the ground, We've then got the problem of each time we come up with a realization, we've got to build a model. Well, that is going to be difficult as well. Every time we come up with a different possibility of what's connected to what or not, we've got to build yet another detailed model, probably with yet another grid. It'll be a great big monstrous heffalump of a model. It probably won't be stable. It'll probably take forever to run. And we've just landed ourselves in, in up with a whole lot of numerical problems. Before we go how to resolve those problems, but a couple more terms. I just want to introduce the notion of categorical variables. A categorical variable is a variable that can take on discrete values, one, two, three. For example, What's the lithology just here? Silt, sand, or clay? That's a categorical variable. A continuous variable, on the other hand, is a variable that uh, can take on a continuous range of variables, of values. So what is the hydraulic conductivity of sand? We've got an upper and lower limit, and it can vary continuously between the, those. So Starting sort of from basic concepts, we've got a methodology here. The devil's in the detail. We conjure up different realizations of that detail. We build a model every time, run the model, and then come up with a predictive probability distribution. However, we've also said that while that is conceptually rock solid, practically it's not. The ability to, to give rise to, to come up with methodologies that will come up with realizations of all that detail in three dimensions is going to defeat us. Then the ability to build one model, let alone a thousand models, all very complex, one model is going to be costly enough, a thousand models will be prohibitively expensive, it won't happen, there has to be a better way. And there is a better way which we'll come to in a moment. But before we do, let's continue on our merry conceptual way and look at the problem of history matching. And then we'll look at the better way. So suppose that uh, I've got head measurements, a number of bores here that have uh, originated from when I started pumping a little while ago. Now, <coughs> That it's not it's not hard to to see that those head measurements, those drawdown measurements, have got a lot of information in them. And what is information? By definition, information is whatever well something that can reduce uncertainty. In this case, the thing we're interested in reducing the uncertainty of is our decision critical model prediction. So when we come up with the probability distribution of that prediction, 
it stands to reason that we can reduce its uncertainty if we can assimilate that information. And we assimilate that information by history matching. So taking the concepts that we've developed so far, just a little bit further, we say as well as running our thousand models into the future to get that predictive histogram, we're also going to run them over the past. And we're going to check model outputs and see how well we match those outputs match what we've observed at these wells here. And if the model doesn't replicate what happens at those wells, well, we say let's throw it away. Obviously, this realization is not what's under the ground, so I'll go on to the next realization. So through that process of pondering up a realization of what's under the ground, running the model over the past, seeing if it matches what happened in the past, throwing it away if it doesn't, and only using for our predictive model runs those that match the past, I have assimilated the information that's in this history matching data set. I then come up with a posterior probability distribution for my prediction. That uncertainty associated with the prediction will be less than the prior because I have assimilated the information that's present in historical measurements of system state, in this case through rejection sampling. This then is the posterior uncertainty distribution of that prediction. So we've extended our methodology to incorporate history matching, thereby assimilating information, quantifying uncertainty and reducing it to the extent that that information allows it to be reduced. The trouble is though that uh, while the methodology is mathematically sound, the chances of me just by random selection of parameters and connectivities and structures in a three-dimensional model regime, model domain, the chances of me coming up with a set of parameters that will allow me to fit what happened in the past even remotely well is about as good a chance of getting a, a royal flush in poker. It just won't happen. We're dealing with what mathematicians call the uh, cursor dimensionality here. So in principle, we've got a way, but there's three things that need to be changed. We've got to have a better way, a way that's practical. With compromises, yes. But firstly, there's the impossibility of having coming up with realizations of this level of detail. Secondly, there's the fact that each model which does will be impossibly complicated and costly. Thirdly, there's the impossibility of history matching using models that are that complicated. So to get over these problems, we'll turn back to Kath and she'll explain a way that takes the same principles but makes them more practical for everyday modeling usage. Over to you, Kath. So let's consider this plan B. Plan B needs to overcome two issues. We can't rebuild the model structure for each realization. Instead, we need a fixed model structure that's also simple enough so that our model runs reasonably quickly. And secondly, we need something better than rejection sampling if we're going to history match to reduce our uncertainty. This requires a fundamental change in our approach to model design and modeling philosophy from what John's just presented. To start with, we need that simpler model structure. We don't need an exact replica of the geology. We only need to represent the hydrologic repercussions of those aspects of the geology that affect how groundwater may move between the well and the river. So we can replace these alluvial deposits and the weathering zone with a single layer. And the same thing with the shale and the interbedded sand lenses and so on until we get to the same thing with our fault and our damage zone. So these layers in our model structure won't change now from realization to realization. Instead, the parameters that I introduce in a moment will do the stochastic work for us. So here we're defining the structure on which we'll hang these parameters. 
The parameters that will live in the structure are named after the hydraulic properties they resemble, but they also represent the connectedness of those properties that exist at a smaller scale than our numerical structure allows. This abstract representation is supported by continuously variable parameters. By continuous, I mean they're real numbers rather than integers, and there are no breaks in the sequence of these real numbers. This continuity allows parameters to be maximally flexible and adjustable, so they're able to represent the values of our varying hydraulic properties and also their connectedness, which in turn is what allows them to do all of the stochastic work of the model. So here is our single fixed model structure, and on the structure we hang our parameters, and we've used pilot point parameters here, those red dots, as our parameterization device. Values are assigned to these points during history matching and then spatially interpolated to the rest of the model grid. These parameter locations are fixed, but because their values can vary, they can represent the many possible subsurface heterogeneities that may influence our prediction. They're able to represent anything that affects the upwards and downwards movement of water between the pumping well and the stream. And so in this way, we avoid the need to rebuild the model structure each realization. And this plan B works most of the time. Um, just note that you can find more detail about pilot points in the PEST roadmaps and in the previous webinars. This slide is just to remind ourselves that each pilot point is representing an average or upscaling of geologic materials and the connectivity through these materials. The prior uncertainties that we assign to these points now also need to represent this upscaling and any additional uncertainty that's incurred by the upscaling process. This assignment of prior uncertainties to upscale parameters isn't easy, but it's the price we pay if we want to assimilate data that will allow us to express and reduce uncertainty with our plan B. So how does this plan B influence our prior uncertainty analysis? Actually, this is essentially as John just described it a moment ago. We assign a prior parameter distribution, but this time it's taking into account the upscale nature of our parameters. We then run the model with each parameter realization and collate the predictions from each model run into a prediction probability distribution just as before. So we have the same process, but now it's been done in an upscale environment. All we need to worry about is not underestimating the uncertainty of our prediction, which could happen if our adopted structure or parameterization don't represent the full capacity of the variability of groundwater flow. However, when we revisit our posterior, plan B really begins to pay dividends. Unlike rejection sampling, we no longer throw away our parameter realizations if they don't fit the data. Now we adjust them until they do fit the data. This is still a fair bit of work, as each time we generate a prior, we need to use software such as PEST or PEST++ to adjust the parameters in each realization. So every prior requires a history matching exercise until it morphs into the posterior. But this is far less work than rejection sampling, and because we do fit the data well, we do extract information from it. And some more terminology, this is called the randomized maximum likelihood method. Recently, Plan B has become a lot more accessible with a new, very efficient technology. It's based on the same idea as in the previous slides, but now all realizations are adjusted at once rather than sequentially. The process starts as before by generating many prior realizations and running the model with each of them. But then the Ensemble Smoother technology generates an approximate sensitivity matrix linking model outputs to parameters. It then uses this matrix to adjust all the realizations at once, rather than the one by one adjustment we just discussed. It's an iterative process, but within a few thousand model runs, those priors will have morphed into a posterior at a far smaller cost than previously. It's also important to note that the cost of doing this adjustment doesn't rise with the number of parameters. This iterative ensemble smooth smoother method is implemented in PEST++, which is freely available. So there's no excuses. With just a few compromises, our plan B is completely doable. And with that, I'll hand back to John. So um, we've, uh, we've got a method, but there are a few little things that we need to talk about before implementing that method and being sure that that method is going to serve us well. 
The first thing to note though, is that we're dealing with three-dimensional systems. As Kath said, the number, of, uh, the number of parameters that we use if we're using the ensemble smoother does not generally slow it down. However, it is important to note that uh, we need to use lots of parameters. Now, this is an important distinction between the way we should model now and the way we should model in the way we were told to model in the old days. In the old days, and still even sometimes now, we're told uh, parameter parsimony. You only need as many parameters as is required to fit the data. Now, if we're quantifying uncertainty, nothing could be further from the truth. If we're quantifying uncertainty, most of the uncertainty associated with predictions made by groundwater models arises through non-uniqueness. The uncertainty analysis process must have the capacity to represent non-uniqueness, in which case the parameters that we can't estimate are just as important as those that we can if we don't want to associate an underrated uncertainty with decision critical predictions. So the days where we abide by those ancient precepts of parameter parsimony are well and truly over. We are dealing with lots of parameters. So the next pro problem we have then is okay, we're dealing with lots of parameters. How do we sign a prior probability distribution to all these parameters? As Catherine just said, we start off with the prior, these get morphed into the posterior, but we need to start off with a respectable prior, a prior that accommodates the role, the upscaled role that these parameters have, representing as they do hydraulic properties and the connectivity of hydraulic properties and other aspects of their upscale nature that spring from the fact that we're using a diminished number of layers and nothing that's nearly as complicated as the real world. The probability distribution we assign to these parameters needs to somehow take all that into account. So each one of these parameters is a random variable. Collectively, they're a random vector. A vector is just a collection of parameters or a collection of anything. And purely for the sake of convenience, we normally use a multi-Gaussian distribution. Now it is convenient, it's very convenient, and it is approximate. It doesn't work all the time, but most times this simplifying assumption will do the job for us. For those occasions where it doesn't, there are other methods which we'll mention briefly, but most cases this is fine and it gives us plenty of levers to represent both the hydraulic properties and the connectivity which these parameters represent in the real world. So what are the repercussions of using a multi-Gaussian distribution? Well, back at school we all learned about Gaussian distributions and normal distributions. If we've got a single random variable, which belongs, which has a Gaussian probability distribution. All we need to characterize its uh, variability is its mean and its standard deviation. The bell curve does the rest. We all learned this at school. If we got two random variables, we need a two dimensional bell curve. But as soon as we move to more than two, let alone a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand parameters, we do have to take into account more than just the mean and the standard deviation. We do have to take into account the statistical relatedness between the different elements of this parameter vector. Sounds hard, but in fact it's easy. So we need the mean of the values. Well, this is an outcome of geological wisdom translated to an upscale parameter environment. And we need what's called a covariance matrix to complete our stochastic characterization of these upscale parameters. If we've got a thousand parameters, then this matrix is a thousand by a thousand. It's got a million elements. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds. Firstly, uh, it's symmetrical, so you've only got half a million elements. Our job has been cut in half. But it's actually pretty easy to fill these matrices. So the diagonal elements of a covariance matrix, these are the variance of the individual parameters. 
Variance is standard deviation. That's, you know, well, you've seen standard deviation before. Again, this is something else that can come from geological wisdom translated into our upscaled environment. The wiggle room of these individual parameters. The off-diagonal elements, these are the covariances between them. So the covariance between this parameter and this parameter, that speaks about the propensity for this one to have a higher value than average if this one has a higher value than average. And so we build up covariances between all the different possibilities of pairings of parameters and put them here and here. Sounds hard? In fact, we make it easy. We normally base these on some pretty simple curves. We say, for example, that in this fault area here, the uh, correlation, the spatial correlation as we call it, the tendency for these to be related to each other statistically, uh, can be represented by a curve that normally diminishes with distance. The closer are the parameters together, the more likely they are to have similar values and that likelihood fades with distance. We put that into a curve and we can construct this matrix pretty simply. Over here in another layer, we'll use a different curve to reflect the different geological environment of this layer. And yet another curve here. And we can use another curve in a different direction. So even though it's a simplification, and even though there'll be times when it's too much of a simplification, where we have really connected permeability that has an overriding influence on the uncertainty of a decision critical prediction, except for those times, we've got enough levers here for this to do a pretty good job. Once we define these curves, and it's pretty easy again, the geologist, we just ask, if we don't know what the curve is, we ask the geologist and he or she will tell us. And this kind of manifests continuity in, in an upscaled environment. How likely is it that properties are same over this distance in this layer and this layer in this fault, turn it into a curve, run a utility from the PEST or PIEMU suite, and within seconds, we've got our covariance matrix. Yes, it's approximate. Yes, it's abstract. But as I said, there's a lot of levers here. Most cases, this will do the job. So as an example, this is, uh, this is an example from actually a GMDSI worked example. And here we're implementing the same principles that we've just been talking about. Well, first we history matched, uh, calibrated to get the minimum error variant solution. Then the, uh, we, we generated using the Ensemble Smoother a suite of parameter fields, all of which fit the history of the system, all of which incorporated priors, morphed the posteriors, which allowed us to fit the data really well and which incorporated geological concepts in an upscaled way. So Bingadon, a little township in southeast Queensland, extracts its water from two bores. The issue is, uh, can we depend on the extraction of this water in really dry times? There's a number of observation wells in the alluvial valley from which it draws its water. As I said before, we weren't scared of parameters, lots of parameters in the model domain along the boundary, equipped with pertinent prior probability distributions, morphed using the ensemble smoother to posterior probability distributions. And you can see that in defining these probability distributions, we were able to use our covariance, those, those continuity curves that I showed you to best effect. With utilities in the pest suite, these can vary with location and direction so that these look like, well, pretty hopefully, pretty uh, well usable or replications of the real thing. And then when we make, uh, as I said before, we're able to fit the past exquisitely well, so we've harnessed that information. And when it comes to make a prediction, we can make it probabilistically. So in this case, the red line talks about the sustainability of this system, the reliability of this system made just with the calibrated model, the minimum error variant solution to the inverse problem, the simplest solution to the inverse problem. And this talks about uh, exceedance. So if we want a, a good supply 100% of the time, 
the prediction says, well, you won't get it because of the fact that there's going to be droughts over the next 100 years. Over some of that time, you'll get less than what you want. And then we make that same prediction using, in this case, an ensemble with 500 realizations, all constrained to fit the historical behavior of the system, and we can look at the uncertainty of that sustainability prediction. With that, we're drawing close to the end now, but I'll just hand over to Kath to talk about some other possibilities, then I'll come back and then we'll finish off. So despite their amazing strengths, ensemble methods in their current implementation can sometimes fall short. This is particularly the case where we have extensively connected permeability and that's important to a prediction. For example, when a prediction is controlled by pervasive alluvial channel features or structural features such as faults that disrupt the host geology. There are other methods available, such as direct hypothesis, direct predictive hypothesis testing, and this can overcome these connectivity issues. But with the remaining time, I'd like to just focus on linear analysis, which is more approximate than all of these other methods listed, but in terms of its didactic worth, it can't be beaten. It includes the old sensitivity analysis that we used to do, but it can do a lot more than that, including quantifying the uncertainty of model parameters and predictions, and exploring how issues such as data scarcity and model simplification can impact these uncertainties. Linear analysis replaces the model with sensitivity analyses that link the past with model parameters and the future with model parameters. These matrices are known as Jacobian matrices, and normally they're calculated by undertaking repeated model runs with individual parameters being incrementally varied. This can take a while if there are many model parameters or when model run times are large, but the payoffs in this investment can be substantial. For example, once those matrices have been filled and combined with a parameter covariance matrix and the statistical characterization of measurement noise, the uncertainty of predicted model outputs can be readily estimated. For example, in this figure, we, show, we can see the upper and lower limits of a pit inflow rate that have been calculated over time. Linear analysis also allows us to explore the contributions to predictive uncertainty made by different parameters and by inference also different processes. We can see how these parameter contributions are reduced by history matching by comparing those crimson columns in the back row with the purple columns in the front row of this graph. This information can also help model design. For example, if the appropriateness of a boundary condition is questioned, we can look at the contribution of this boundary to the uncertainty of our prediction. If its contribution is small, we have shown that it's not necessary to build a more complex model. That boundary is a sufficient representation of the more complex processes that occur at and behind it. Linear analysis also allows us to describe the worth of data by the extent to which that data can reduce the uncertainty of a prediction. For example, in this graph, we can see that the transient head data is worth more than the other measurements considered. This data worth method can also be used to explore the worth of different spatial and temporal frequencies of measurements. And because our linear analysis doesn't require the actual value of observations or parameters, only the sensitivity of corresponding model outputs to parameters, we're able to explore the worth of data that hasn't even been gathered yet, as well as existing data. And so it becomes easy to see the most cost effective way to spend the field data acquisition budget. The outcomes of linear analysis can also be mapped spatially. And here we can see the extent to which uncertainties of hydraulic conductivity parameters have been reduced through the history matching process. Blue areas show where there's been little to no reduction in the uncertainty of those parameters from our prior. And the red areas show where, show where there's been a large reduction in the uncertainty of those parameters. Not surprisingly, the biggest reductions are occurring where we have plenty of observations, which are those green dots. So a map such as this shows that even with a perfectly calibrated model, predictions made in the blue area may be just as uncertain as if they were made with an uncalibrated model. And with that, I'll hand back to John. Well, before finishing off, I just want to reflect a little. So we can quantify uncertainty. As, as we've talked about, there are some compromises here. 
but uh, but it's doable and it's eminently doable. Uh, we've got to have a model that can do it. And in, in our next talk, we talk about appropriate complexity. And uh, as Catherine mentioned earlier, that's kind of very closely related to this talk. Um, you can't do all this magic if you've got a model that's inappropriately complex. We have to learn how to upscale and work in that upscaled environment. So stay tuned for the next webinar. <clears throat> but let me also just remark a little bit on management repercussions. Now I'm not a manager, I'm not a decision maker, but I can see that while everyone wants uncertainty, I'm not sure everyone knows what to do with it. But I am sure that uh, discussions pertaining to model uh, predictions may have to be perhaps a little bit more mature than what we're used to uh, up to now. So let's just have a look at, at, at one repercussion of the fact that we now ha have technology that not only allows us to quantify and reduce the uncertainties of decision critical predictions that, that, that can encapsulate what we know, the trouble is it also quantifies what we don't. It makes it very clear that we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future when we do stuff, yet we still have to make decisions. And making those decisions where the fact that we don't know quite what's going to happen is staring us right in the face is going to require a more mature approach than in the past. So suppose you want to develop a resource here and there's some uh, something here where we're concerned about the impact. Perhaps drawdowns are not allowed to fall below that red line if we pump here or put a mine here or something. So in the old days, we'd make a prediction. We'd say, ah, the model predicts that everything's going to be okay. Let her rip. Let's do it. These days, we have uh, uncertainty interval associated with that prediction and some of that uncertainty strays into that red area. What do we do now? We have to look at these results with a little bit more sophistication. We have to ask, can I tolerate this risk? Now risk can be loosely equated to the cost of something going wrong times the probability of something going wrong. So that element of risk now has to be front and center of the decision making process <clears throat> and the modeler's job is to give the decision maker that vital decision making ingredient of the risks associated with any course of management action. Now what immediately happens here is that um, if for example the, uh, I'm risk averse as a decision maker then I have to move this curve upward and therefore I'm effectively moving that management threshold upward. And I'm moving it upward by a distance equal to possibly half the uncertainty associated with my prediction. And there's one thing about uncertainty in groundwater modelling, seek and you will find. All predictions are going to have uncertainty associated with them sometimes a lot of uncertainty. So then I can ask, well, maybe there's other places where I'm interested in the impact. Maybe there's a number of places where we're concerned about what the impact of this development might be. And in all of those places, this threshold has been moved up, maybe quite a lot if we're very risk averse. Now this, I think, has the potential to have uh, some very worrying impacts on the way we make decisions. It can be seen, I guess, as a free kick to those stakeholder groups who are incredibly risk averse. But we just have to keep a couple of things in mind here but when we look at the outcomes of modelling in this new age. Firstly, the risk of something going wrong at a certain place might be low. The risk of it going wrong simultaneously at all places may be very, very low. And that has to be taken into account. Unless there's a common cause here like a huge drought or something, the risk of all of these bad things happening simultaneously will be a lot less and well, the probability of them all happening simultaneously will be less than the probability of an individual occurrence. 
Secondly, if uncertainty analysis can tell us that we really don't quite know and that something can still go wrong, it can also tell us how it will go wrong. And it can, th this gives us the ability then to be much more sophisticated than in the past in our monitoring and in the design of adaptive management strategies for which early warning of something going wrong can be guaranteed. So at that stage I'll finish. My only point here is to draw attention to the fact that as, as technologists, the, the technology is improved to the point where we can quantify uncertainty and in doing so make it clear we don't quite know what's going to happen. I think now the decision making process has also needs to be advanced to make better use and to hold more educated discussions on what modelling has the potential to give people. Finally, in case you want to do any of this stuff, you go to the GMDSI web pages, there's links to the PEST and PEST++ web pages. Everything we've talked about, there's tutorials and worked examples to show you how to do it. And that brings us to the end.